So you bought a Switch, and that one black friend in your circle convinced you to buy Super Smash Bros. You play it for a little while and find you're actually having an enjoyable time, until it slowly begins to dawn on you that this game is way more competitive than you thought. You may have discovered it when you joined your first online arena and got a free prostate exam. Maybe you saw a four-hour documentary and decided to try your hand in a competitive environment, only to wind up getting another free prostate exam. Maybe you've always known you wanted to play the game seriously, but because this is your first fighting game, your prostate was getting more checkups than some European with free healthcare. Being the eager McBeaver of your family lineage, you don't let the many defeats sway you. Instead, you sign up for online classes at Washington Medical and begin studying some Smash videos so you too can learn how to give out free unsolicited anal check-ins. You watch combo videos, listen to people explain the mechanics, and heard the paid professionals speak on certain subjects. But, for whatever reason, the results are still the same. This video isn't meant to replace any of the other content you could be watching, but rather give a foundation for you to work from. And what I'm about to cover could apply to just about any fighting game to some degree. Honestly, this video has probably been made over 700 times, but fuck it, maybe this one will click with you, and you'll be the first one in your family to break the poverty cycle and become a respected physician. This is not about character combos, you're not going to hear a bunch of technical terms. This is just going to go over the process of improvement. Good news! There's only about five general steps. Bad news. Each step takes an immense amount of time and practice. But if you put in the hours, you'll see the results. There is no shortcut, trickety trick, Batman gambit, or single thing I can tell you to do to instantly improve your win ratio. Unless it's picking Meta Knight and Brawl, or Bayonetta and Smash 4, or breaking the other guy's wrist. Everything I'm going to tell you is going to require a lot of your time. This is why fighting games tend to have a niche market. Getting to the point where your ape brain actually comprehends what's happening is usually higher than what most people want to bother with. They're usually too busy leading fulfilling lives. We, however, are playing a children's fighting game with characters who take their clothes off and they step on your dick. All I'm trying to do is take you, the button-mashing player who panics when they're off stage, and get you to the point of entry. Because from there, only the best player will come out on top. Let's begin! Now, what I'm about to tell you, most people find obvious. So if you're beyond the point of having a character you like to play as, you can skip this if you'd like, but there still might be some good info for you here. For the rest of us, it's important that we learn the lifelong trait of commitment. Yes, random strange is fun, and swapping between characters in between matches with your friends is a jolly good time, as the kids say. But you need to find a character that fits you. It's okay, you're pretty and young. Get out there and play the field. See what life has to offer for you. But when you find the one that works well with all of your quirks and flaws, that's the one you're going to lock into. Which character tickles that fancy? You'll know it when you hit those buttons and the character responds in a way that makes you want to put a ring on it. Something about your selection just feels right. And your primate brain senses should be yelling at the back of your mind that you're not going to be doing any better. Find that character. Like I said earlier, this process is really not instant. The roster is quite large, but it would behoove you to try all the characters, at least for a few matches. Yes, all of them. From there, you can gauge what you like and don't like, and also plant the seeds of success for a later section. But before we can truly move on to the next step, you need to find someone you love to play. This is crucial for the foundation. Not too hard yet, right? Let's move on. So you've entered the realm of a serious relationship. You played the field for a little while, you and your partner have made the vows, and now you're in it for the long haul. If it took you a while to get to this point, 
Don't worry. Getting to step three will take you far, far longer, because now it's time to create your fundamentals. We're going to start simple and work our way up, beginning with... No, this is not as simple as it sounds, and this step is very crucial to any type of long-term success. Unlike other fighters where all stages conform to a flat surface with different set dressing, unless you're years ahead of your time like Tekken 4. Learning character movement is usually restricted to learning your character's attacks, how much time it takes to do those attacks, the space that attack covers, and how quickly multiple attacks can work in tandem. Otherwise, you're simply moving towards or away from your opponent in environments that have few distinctions. You may be caged in, there may be bottomless pits for you to ring someone out, but more or less, the only real distinction between characters are the attacks they perform. Being a platform game, Frankenstein with a fighting game, you have a few more things to keep track of in this department. In Smash, the movement consists of a character's speed on the ground, a character's speed in the air, the attacks the character can perform, how fast they can perform those attacks, the space those attacks can cover, and how long a character can stay airborne with the tools provided to them. The very nature of how one wins a game is tied into the platforming mechanics, since not falling into the bottomless pit is a big piece of what determines the winner. For this step, your sole job is to understand how to control your character and get the feeling for what they can and cannot do. And I mean, to the point where your attention to the screen is near optional due to how well you know the character. Because in order to play any fighting game effectively, the last thing you want to be worried about is your character. Thankfully, Smash doesn't have long combo lists. You simply have two buttons and four general directions to pick from. Hitting each button without stick input will do a set of attacks, and hitting each button with a direction selection will do another. For the B button, or whatever you have assigned as special move, this is straightforward enough. The special attacks do the same thing regardless of context. A, on the other hand, houses 11 attacks by itself. Hitting A with no stick direction on the ground, hitting A with no stick direction in the air, hitting A while moving the stick above, below, or across from you on the ground, hitting A while tilting the stick to the halfway position above, below, or across from you, on the ground, or selecting above, below, or across from you in the air while hitting A. Bar the fighting game characters in the game, these are all the moves to all the characters. The exact same combinations. No button mixing experimentation required. Tilting the stick is quite hard to finesse in the moment, which is why I recommend setting the right stick to the tilt attack. These are quite important to the majority of the roster. We can't move on to actual movement until you understand what each input does, and are able to perform each attack consistently at will. No, it's it always B. I thought it was up B. Oh, is it not up B? But that's the tilt, that's the tilt. Until you get to that point, moving on is simply not possible. Once you have a feel for the character's moveset, we can head to the actual movement. Now Smash has over 100,000 stages on the list, but thankfully for the competitive environment, you only have to get familiar with a few layouts as these are the only stages deemed not hostile enough to interfere in your fight. You will have the flat surface, different spacing and stage sizes for the tri-platform, the dual platform, the single platform, and Lila as a stage as well. A lot of newcomers don't particularly care about the stage, they just want to get going. This is your first mistake, as each character on the roster will prefer a different type of stage. For example, if you have a character that likes to kill people by throwing them off the top of the screen, and stages with a larger distance to the ceiling, or ceilings obstructed by objects, are inherently not preferred by that character. They may have otherwise won a fight if that ceiling was just a hair lower. Some characters want flat surfaces so they can abuse projectile weapons, leaving less room for other people to get near them. Some characters want the platforms to extend the amount of time they can spend examining the prostate of the other person with their own two hands. No! 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 I'm... Oh shit. Depending on who you've legally bonded yourself to, it may behoove you to realize which stage type this is. But we don't know that yet. 
you must simply practice on all of them. The basic act of just moving around seems simple enough at first glance, but it's important to know exactly how your character can handle on each stage. Let's take Politana on Smash 4 because it was back when no one else played her. Because she wasn't very good. Don't worry, the advice still applies to Ultimate, or Melee, or Project M, or the Nickelodeon game. She's fairly quick, jumps pretty high, and has a fairly solid speed in the air. Not too shabby in the movement department. Now, the goal with character movement is essentially to eliminate any unnecessary choices when traversing. Choices which, when made, will allow the other person to give you an unscheduled physical. A good first step is seeing what the bare minimum requirement is to move around each stage. Try running a few laps on the different setups to see how you can speed this process up. You may find it's a little harder to pull off than you might think. For running laps, I have the requirement to touch all platforms, and starting off it begins a little clunky, having not played this version of Smash for a while. On Ultimate, this is fine, but doing it here puts me back in the shoes of a player that's not perfectly comfortable moving their character around. After some practice, moving around the circuit is consistent, but slow. From this point, you can start mixing in the tacks to see if you can smooth this process out and speed it up. The more time you invest on every stage, the more comfortable you will be when making choices in combat. You'll slowly stop doing pointless double jumps when a single will suffice, and you can start to plan attacks based on positioning. For instance, a lot of characters, Politano included, can throw quick aerial attacks when falling down from platforms. So recognizing some key positions will let you throw your next attack quickly, and safely out of range of retaliation. It's a small option, but this alignment happens more than you think. Some characters will have more movement options than others. I chose Palutena for this example due to her ability to repeatedly warp whenever she hits an edge. Normally, when she teleports, she's left in a vulnerable state. But if she manages to teleport into any type of edge, she is free to do anything else. This can translate into safely returning to the ground, throwing off your opponent, or mixing up attacks. It's another situational tool, but the more tools you have in your bag, the better. Once you're comfortable moving, throw in some more attacks into the laps. Also make sure to reverse directions to not get comfortable going one way. If you really want to get picky with it, you can slow the game down some and see what attacks can be used to keep your movement the most fluid. I like using Smash 4 as the example here, since its engine isn't as kind to movement as Melee or Ultimate. The engine in 4 dissuades quick turning since there will always be a lag when changing directions outside of a very small window. To get around this, you have to use the shield, which stops momentum and allows a dash in the opposite direction. To move around quickly in Smash 4, you definitely have to see what is and is not allowed within the engine. This is also true for Ultimate, but it's far more forgiving. An example of a movement quirk in both of these games is the inability to fall through platforms once you do an attack. If you want to make a quick descent to the ground, then you can't take any swings at all in the air. But if you're planning on landing on a platform, a quick aerial attack will ensure your landing. Knowing this quirk also works in your favor during combat since you can narrow down landing options of a character attacking in the air. Remember every character has different attacks with different properties and testing out how each move affects your traversal on stage will go a long way in keeping your movement down to the necessary. Taking a fist to the prostate can come from overshooting a jump or using an attack in an inopportune time. If moving around each stage doesn't feel like riding a bike with your character, then the rest doesn't really matter. Moving quirks that will assist you here in Ultimate is knowing your character can directly make 180 degree turns so long as they are just beginning a run. To see that distance, just flick the control stick. That's the character's initial dash. When you leave that state, you will lag when making turns. You can repeatedly hit the stick to always keep the character in the state of beginning a run for sharper turns. Your character can jump high by holding a jump button, or jump low by tapping the jump button. Hitting down on the control stick will make your character fall faster, which is good for aerial attacks since they usually rely on low jumping. When grabbing a ledge, you can hit down to fall, then quickly hit jump and forward A to allow for a quick attacking move when getting back on stage. Attacking with A and jumping at the same time will always result in a short hop, and you'll eventually learn to hate this. 
Hitting the shield button in the air without any directional inputs causes you to dodge in place. Hitting the shield button in the air with directional inputs causes you to change momentum while dodging. However, recovering from this takes longer than just dodging in place. There's more covered by other in-depth videos that you can use to round yourself out, like hitting the shield button just as you're rising above a platform to slide around. But only do that when you really start to get comfortable with the basics. This isn't a list to memorize, these are things that need to come natural from the time you spend with the character experimenting on how to improve basic movement. So you're moving around all the stages like a wizard, and your hands have all but contracted cerebral palsy. You can zip around the platforms and toss attacks without skipping a beat. You know exactly how your character behaves when you move that control stick, and you've done it so much you're pretty bored with the exercises. Hell, you're so bored you're nearly moving around with your eyes closed. I was hitting people today with that megawatt and fucking them up. That's good. Cause now it's time to get into attacking. Your character has attacks which also 100% confirm to other moves. This is a combo. Something that will never fail. Bayonetta's sliding kick to the witch twists. Min Min's sliding kick to the flip kicks. Palutena's fireball to the laser trifecta given it was connected at the right distance. There are scores of videos out there to help you learn your character's essential starting hits and the appropriate follow-ups, but nothing helps you understand the flow of attacks and just throwing something out and observing the effect. After all, Smash Bros, despite having combos, never gives out a form of command list to perform them. All combos in-game are found by player experimentation, and the more impressive highlight reel moments are performed on a basic understanding of characters' attacks and good prediction. Here, slowing down the game and throwing on trajectory lines will definitely help you, since you need to be learning these angles, to the point where you can predict hits while playing your Colonel Sanders dating sim. A good rule of thumb for attacking is making the common sense decisions. To make common sense decisions, you need to know where your attack will send the opponent if it connects. Watch a set with newer players and then a professional set, and then you'll see what I mean. For an amateur example, let's use myself. I landed down here with Palutena which has a very specific launch angle that will happen every time it lands. After performing this move, she's left recovering, so we can't really confirm this into anything. We just have to pick something that would make sense based on where Sora is going to end up, and we have a few options. His damage is low, and we know from testing he won't fly too far, so we could retreat a few steps and use one of her two projectiles to keep the pressure. That would make sense. We could choose to keep chasing the opponent down, and attempt another physical attack that has a plausible chance of hitting the little bastard. That would make sense. We could simply wait, and see how Sora reacts from being hit, to attempt to gauge our opponent. This doesn't put us in harm's way, and it allows us to get valuable information. This also makes sense. Point is, there are things in this moment that have a sound logic behind them. But this is an amateur set, so naturally the next move that comes out, makes zero sense. In no universe does using the up tilt attack work after this move. This is a mistake in every sense of the word. Down A sends Sora too far away for this to hit, Sora is in too much hit stun to run into this attack after it connects, but it's not so long and he can't punish this move. It makes zero sense to do, yet it happened. These type of mistakes happen more often the further down in skill level you go. The players don't often understand the angles that their moves send the opponent, so they'll often just throw out moves or take a course of action that makes no sense after getting a successful hit. And so on. The reason why this happens is because they themselves are not comfortable moving their character around, and they don't understand the effects their moves have on others. The character combos can be searched and studied, but that's not a suitable substitute for getting in the lab and understanding the knockback angles of your moves. 
Remember, every combo or string is an out there, and there's many valid ways to play the same character. You get these different approaches because different people come to discover different viable follow-ups after getting a hit. The amount of damage the opponent has will affect knockback, and combos will open and close for different moves depending on this number. Your opponent's weight will also play a factor in this, and a good habit to get into is trying things out on a light character, a medium character, and a heavy character to get the general idea. There's more to it than this, since characters in the same class have different fall speeds, but it'll help you get the general idea. A big component for the player that wins is making more optimal decisions after you get a hit in. The more nonsensical things you end up doing, the more moments your opponent has to get the combo train running on you. You learn every day. Every day, a new learning experience. I'm just getting kinda, kinda, kinda tired at this point of losing. <laughs> Getting your ass beaten. Uh, yeah, I'm just kinda sick of it. Yeah. You need to understand the angles and trajectories your moves have on other people, so you can make the smart decisions, not just toss out random moves that have no future. Now, mistakes are gonna happen. Things move quite fast. The reason I chose the bad choice was because I simply didn't expect my down air to connect, and I don't have the reaction time necessary to switch on a dime. The plan was for Sora to block that attack, then for the twirly pull to quickly catch Sora releasing his guard to attack the blocked hit, playing on prediction since my reaction can't keep up. Each of us is going to have a different limit on what we can follow, but it's still important to make plausible decisions when we get a hit that we expect. Now dishing it out is all well and good, but defense is just as important. It's an essential factor in any type of fighting game. Normally this is either blocking until your opponent has exhausted their attack string, or parrying mid-combo by taking some form of risk. Here defense is simply shielding until your opponent exhausts their attack string, releasing shield to parry the hit at the right moment to cut off your attacker, rolling or dodging in place to evade the attack, or quickly recovering from being attacked to prevent a combo that would have otherwise continued. To quickly recover from an attack, you tap the shield button anytime you're about to slam face first into any type of surface. When this happens, you can hit the control stick as well to either roll towards or away from the attacker. When I say any surface, I mean any surface. So if, say, a monkey tries to throw you into a wall, so you bounce off of it and die, you can hit shield and kill the momentum. Like attacking, good defense comes from understanding. So if you did what I said in section 1 and got your feet wet with the whole roster, you have some idea of what the other character can do. Not to an expert level, but you know their moves in general. The more you fight a certain character, the better you can tailor your defensive approach. Cause if, say, you were fighting a plumber, and you've seen over and over again that he likes to combo by throwing you onto the ground, and spinning with his fist in your ass, then you know to start the match by looking out for a grab. So in this instance, better defense is movement rather than shielding. This is different for a character who likes to start combos with a straight-up attack. If their optimal combo begins with a slide kick, then you know to keep your finger on the shield button at all times. Knowing your defensive options is good. Knowing what options to apply to which characters is better. But like all things, that only comes from time, and finding the competent player of each character, which is essentially the next step in this little journey. Now you don't need to learn how to play as the entire roster, though that would massively help. But the player who knows each character's bread and butter move and attack options is the one with the advantage. In any fighting game, you'll win because you were attacking at the right time and defending at the right time. The only way to know how to defend is to understand how the other one likes to attack. Because if you block the first three hits out of a five hit combo and let go of block to try to interject too early, you're going to be eating hits you shouldn't have. Honestly, a more standard fighting game illustrates this point quite well. By learning combos, you increase the amount of damage you can output when you land a hit. This means you're not relying on single strikes while the opponent has multi-hit moves. By studying the opponent's character, you can learn with trial and error when it's safe to interject. Both of you have moves that are generally fast, generally slow, and moves that can't be blocked. And on a flat surface, where movement choices are more straightforward, success comes from interjecting at the right time. Attack too soon while your opponent is attacking, then you'll eat damage. Attack too late if your opponent stops, and they already have their guard up. The point is to get in with a plausible decision, in the moment it's safe to do so. 
then maximize the damage you do with the opening you seize. In Smash, because you're also playing a platformer, getting this moment has another layer. Not to say other fighters don't have things like spacing, but Smash is a unique case since the game handles so differently from the rest of the genre. There really is no substitute here other than time and experience. The more you watch a character move, the more you can see how they generally like to operate 9 times out of 10. Each character has certain moves they'll want to lead with to maximize damage, and knowing that will allow your defensive play a better chance to succeed. You know Falco is going to up tilt, you know Min Min is going to slide into your shins or give you the old one too. You know Sora is going to suck dick behind the Taco Bell. If you know these things, you can play around them, or at the very least, keep an eye out for it. But like all fighters, all characters aren't created equal, and you'll see more faces and gain more familiarity with certain matchups over others. And the game essentially becomes a certain roster of characters deemed viable enough to win at the highest levels. So the players taking things very seriously will gravitate towards a specific group. Then people become very, very familiar fighting Fox, or Marth, or Pikachu, or Rob, or Isis. It's also what allows very good players to waltz in with very underrated characters at specific points in time and shake things up. You may be very good at fighting Fox, but how about a Red Yoshi? How often do you play one at this level? You may have gotten very practiced with the characters you expect to see, but how about some dog and his bird? It really doesn't pay to ignore anything, but at the same time we all only have so much access. Maybe no one in your friend group wants to play Ridley, or Little Mac, or Isis, so you just never learn. And that may be your downfall when it matters most. Even trying to rectify things online, you still won't see certain characters. I can count on a single hand the number of Politanos I ran into on Smash 4 Online despite the number of hours in that game. And even when you do, are you getting the best out of that character? This is one of the hardest steps to clear, and even when you think you're doing alright, someone's gotta come along and show you why you were sleeping on something you shouldn't be. So, let's review. You've dabbled enough with the roster and understand what all of them have in their move kits to some basic degree. Easier to do if you've played all these games iteration by iteration as opposed to having 80 new faces you've never seen. You've locked into a character, you understand how they move around, and you've worked them so much they slip on like a glove. It's like riding a bike. You've seen some videos, you've put in some practice, and you can do some basic combos with your character. On top of that, you understand the knockback angles of your character, and you can make probable decisions. You've set aside some time, watched some matches, played online for a little while, maybe went to some local events, and you're starting to gather how other characters like to attack. Now, you're ready to play the fighting game. You don't play the matchup, you play the opponent. The whole point of getting comfortable with movement is so that you can reduce the amount of brain power it takes to pilot them and instead focus that energy on watching the opponent. The combos, defense, the roster's attacking preferences, all that shit are the keys you need to begin playing the chess matchup at the higher levels. It's important to know what every character wants in terms of their attacks and movement, but it's far more important to know how your opponent chooses them, and to know that your eyes need to be squarely on them at all times. Watching. Always watching at every moment because everything they do is data everything is information to be used later the best way to describe this is with an example so here i'm playing someone who's not entirely comfortable piloting this character they're still more concerned with their movement i'm strictly focused on them because they're going to hand me the keys to their prostate when the match starts, we first just observe what Mimin does in what context. When does she attack? Is there a pattern? Is she going for her typical combos? That type of thing. Then we need to observe that it happens frequently with that same context. We care more about this specifically when we are the ones taking damage. Like here, I'm in front of Minmin. Not too close, not too far, so she chooses grab, which is successful. That does not go unnoticed but that may have just been her reading my attack. But then she does it again when I'm off stage, which for me is a tell. 
It says, if I am somewhere in this window, Min Min will likely try to grab, because she doesn't seem to care about the context. And sure enough, when this position is observed again, that's frequently the option she chooses. It gets to the point where I can even bait this option out of her as she tries to follow along. After this moment where she quick recovers and lands a dive kick, I am sent back. Because Min Min has still not changed her habits, I'm still assuming the grab rule is in effect. She is running in, so I jump forward once, the window happens again, and on schedule, she grabs. So I simply double jump and carry on. Recklessness resets things, but at this point in the match, I've been punished enough from her standard jabs at this distance. She was letting the hits, but the context in which it was happening did not go unnoticed. So even before she makes the move, I'm going to hit down B, because she's been shown to use her standard jabs in this situation. Whenever I am X distance away, the answer should be punch. And sure enough, this is essentially how you play, and is why you've likely been three-stocked once or twice in your time. The reason is because you likely have a set of habits and are failing to realize it yourself while your opponent sees it clearly. To yourself, it just seems like you're making the logical decision, but your opponent is basing themselves on what you specifically like to do. Fighting games are like mental chess, chess you have to play across a few games if people get serious enough. You might say, pick a character you don't play that often against someone trying their hardest. For the whole first game, you don't necessarily try to win, you just throw out attacks and poke and prod at your opponent to see how they react, checking for patterns and responses, seeing if they are changing things up. Are they cycling between a few options? How do they prefer to get in? The whole first game, your opponent is trying to win, displaying their habits and tactics honestly. You're simply just trying to pick them apart. Hell, they may even 3-stock you. But then the following match, you walk in with the combination, and you're able to surgically win the match that may have previously seemed one-sided. Happens at the higher levels all the time, when a professional may drop a game to an enthusiast, but that victory is short-lived because the professional doesn't allow any exchange to happen without learning something about how their opponent plays. To mitigate this is to be conscious of your own habits and patterns. And when you find yourself on the losing end, you need to have that ability to slow down and change your approach. But in the end, the winner is the one who usually understands the other, while making themselves a mystery. There's playing around a specific character, then there's playing around a specific person. Let's take Zero Suit Samus. Two enthusiasts I play with, and two drastically different methods. To play this optimally, you need to play around ZZS herself as a character and what she can potentially do, as well as what the other person chooses to do. One utilizes her movement tools to get out of harm's way and as a means of setting up other attacks. The other runs in more head-on and chooses options you wouldn't expect due to lack of experience. Different tactics will be required for both, despite them using the same character. The flaw of the more inexperienced Samus is her tendency to panic, and the struggle with the movement aspect, frequently taking her own life. She has to spend too much brain power on her own character, so she's unable to engage the fight on the level she needs to in order to win. She can't think about things like how her opponent is choosing to engage her, and how they react to her own stimuli. So all the information displayed is missed, and the same tactics continue to work on her. This hurdle isn't overcome by looking up Samus combos and random pieces of movement tech. The solution is simple comfortability. The solution is simple comfortability. Comfortability. Cistern. The solution is simple comfortability. The flaw of the more experienced Samus is the tendency towards the same habits. Basically, if something works, he will continue to do it. The logic in that decision seems sound at first. After all, why change if the same tactic proves effective? But the more shameless one engages in their attacks, the easier it is for someone to pick you apart. Rotating out a working strategy for a completely different option at regular intervals will keep the opponent unable to make accurate predictions. Getting to play somebody over and over is all well and good, but in a world where you may only get to play against somebody once or twice, how fast you can recognize patterns and overcome them is often the deciding factor at the higher levels. Playing one-off matches with the goal of trying to dissect players is a good way to practice this skill. You may not necessarily win, but see if you can get in the habit of reading and baiting others. And also recognize when you are being baited yourself. 
This is essentially what you are seeing at the top level. Why some weird move choices work out of nowhere. Why two people go back and forth just beating the shit out of each other. It's all a game of mental chess. One you can't really play if you don't have the other four steps down to some degree. It's likely why you've probably seen your performance drop if you're trying to incorporate new combos. Or movement options. The unfamiliarity takes away the rain power to be spent on the game itself. But that's basically it. You're now ready to main Sandy Cheeks. But you're probably gonna fail out of medical school.